thought that I you thought that I was worth saving and not by throwing a life raft and pulling me in but Jesus jumped in and saved us himself oh that's so good I am excited scared out of my mind and thrilled to be here all at the same time it is officially my first Sunday as senior pastor at First Northeast on Resurrection Sunday. And I am honored to have you here. And those of you who are online, I'm humbled that you're watching with us this morning. It just feels good to have my family with me. It feels good to have my family with me. Amen? Today, we're going to continue in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to dig in something that's very sincere and serious. Because Jesus coming back is no laughing matter. Y'all don't mind me teaching a little bit on Resurrection Sunday, do you? We're going to get it done. Turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 12. The Gospel of Luke chapter 12. And as you're turning there, if you're like me, you were fighting back emotions as this song was being sung because just to be reminded of all that he did. Because when I think about Jesus and what he's done for me, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Don't even start, Patrick. I see you trying to get on the drum. Don't do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to display a little self-control while I can because I got to get through this message but I want you to understand, today's message is not something that I just wrote to tell you. It was spoken unto me first. And I had to walk in the conviction of this truth and say, Lord, where am I in this? And so I say to you, don't think of who needs to hear it. You hear it first. Open your heart, open your soul right now to hear his word and allow his word to fall fresh on you. Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 4. Everybody got it? If you got it, say amen. If you don't, say hold on, preacher. All right. Let's get into the text. Jesus is talking. He said, and I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he is killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are more value than many sparrows. And I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him, the Son of Man, will also confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. I want to teach this morning on the message, don't deny him. Don't deny him. Here we are celebrating the day that Jesus came back like he said he would. And if you were joining in on Friday night, I had the chance to talk about the accomplished work that he did and how we need to shift our life, our mindset, even our decision making to be in alignment with him because we're just a boat in the water. He's the lighthouse guiding us through the water. And so what I want us to look at today in Luke 12, I want us to see something that Jesus has for us in this nook and cranny text. And I don't want us to miss it because he's talking about our lifestyle. He's talking about things that we need to understand and keep. 
And he wants us to see that denying him isn't just one singular thing, like flat out coming out of your mouth and say, I do not believe. That's definitely one way to do it. But there's other ways in the life of those who say they believe to act like they really don't. It's great that we get dressed up. It's great that we come out. It's great that we do these things. But within this one hour, is that all he's worth? Is he only worth getting dressed on one day, sitting still for a little while, and having someone else pray over you? Is that it? I want you to consider if someone did something amazing to rescue you, how would you respond to them? Would you live your life as though you only need to celebrate them in front of them, but everyone else may not ever know that you even know them? Can we walk through the text together? Let's look at verse 4 and begin there. Jesus starts off this way, And I say to you, my friends. Jesus has shifted from just my servants or those who are following me, those who I'm changing. He shifts to call them friends. Jesus just pulled aside the disciples in front of a multitude of people. He first warns about not being conformed to the ways the Pharisees do things, and he pulls them aside and he says, my friends. Can I say that to you this morning? My friends. My friends. Whom I love, who I give all for, my friends. Do not be afraid of those who can kill your body. Why would Jesus start there? Because he knows full well who is about to deliver him to the Gentiles to be scourged, to be spit upon, to be mocked, and ultimately crucified. Jesus is like, I know what they're about to do. I'm not scared of them. I tell the truth because I am the truth. And so he's saying, don't you be afraid to tell the truth. Don't be afraid to do what's right because of what someone else may see. Because if you're more afraid of this person than you are of what God will see, who's really in control of your life? Oh, don't miss this. Because the Lord is making it plain. He says, don't be afraid of those that can kill you. Now, I don't know about you, when I think about someone trying to kill me, whether or not you're a hardcore or super awesome militant, something in you still goes, <laughs> right? So to say that, you can imagine the disciples going, you're saying, don't be afraid if they can kill me? Sounds a little off, doesn't it? Let's keep digging in. After that, he says, and after that, can't do anything else. What's Jesus mean? He's doing two things. He's saying, one, they're not really in control even though they think they are. And number two, even if that comes to pass, that's all they can do. They have no control over anything else. He's confirming the after this life. The after this life. It's real. You can't see it now, but we walk by faith and not by sight. And then that's in context because in 2 Corinthians, he's talking about those who've fallen asleep in Jesus. He's saying, don't worry, you'll see them again because we know they're there because Jesus said they'd be there. And he's saying, look, they can't do anything else after that. But, y'all have come to know that word for me now, right? It's a pivot. He says, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him. Now, this is a reminder because any Jewish person would have known God is great, God is amazing, right? But sometimes when life happens, we seem to forget things. We forget not only what he's done, but what he's brought us through and who he is in his very position. We start to see people in positions ahead of us, and we forget that God is way bigger than them. And so what he's saying here, he says, fear him, So because after, after he's killed the body, he has the power to say where you'll be for eternity. Yes, I say to you, fear him. I want to give you the first point. I'm going to be a good Baptist. Just stay with me. First point is this, you cannot fear two things equally. You cannot fear two things equally. Raise your hand if you're afraid of spiders. Anybody afraid of spiders? You can be real, I'm not gonna judge you. Okay, cool, cool. Don't worry, God's not gonna condemn you because you're afraid of spiders, okay? There's a thing called arachnophobia, right? Okay, who's afraid of snakes? 
Am I afraid of snakes? Oh, wow. Yeah, I was bold with that one. Lord! <laughs> See a snake in the grass. Satan! <laughs> right? Let's just say you were afraid of both. And you're in a very narrow hallway, and there's a pack of spiders on this side, and there's a pack of snakes on this side, and they're both approaching you. Which one are you going to overcome first? Right, because the spiders are you're less afraid of. You're like, I'll offend these spiders, but I ain't offending no snakes. I'm going to try to get over on the spiders, but I ain't messing. You know, Indiana Jones, maybe I'm dating myself. I'm not messing with them snakes. You can't fear them both the same. No different than you can't love the same. Oh, I'm not, that's another sermon. I'm going to say that for later. Come back, catch that one. But you can't fear two things equally. So what Jesus is saying is if you're so focused on your fear of these people, they're going to drive direct and cause you to respond in ways that please those you fear. But if you fear the Lord, then when the Lord says go, no matter what's in front of you, you're going to, you're going to do it, and you're going to do it knowing that the Lord is all the time. And all the time, he's good. So first point is, you cannot fear two things equally. Jesus is saying it's time to pick. He's not done. Look at verse 6. I love this. Pay attention. Jesus just talked about fear and you having fear of God. Watch what he does starting in verse 6. He's so specific. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Now, Jesus could have said all five of them are remembered by God, but he got real specific and said not. How often do we put ourselves in collective boxes? We put ourselves, I mean, society makes us do it sometimes, but we'll categorize ourselves, we'll put ourselves in a group. We'll even use we statements when we're saying our own opinion. Oh, I'm by myself. And immediately Jesus says, are not five sparrows, small little birds, not much to eat. You're not, you don't have Kentucky Fried Sparrows, right? There's not a lot of meat there. He said, even five of those is worth two copper coins. And God's attention, God's attention, his eyes and his memory are on each one. Verse 7, he says this, but the very hairs on your head are all numbers. Look at the intentionality and awareness of God. Not only does he know that you have hair, but he can subtract, don't, don't be mad, but he's, but he's aware of what's there and what's not. That's how much he knows about you and how much he loves you. He says, all the hairs on your head are numbered. Do not fear. Hold on, Jesus. <laughs> You just told us to fear the Son of Man. You just told us to fear God. Now you're saying, don't fear? Watch this. Let me help. He's saying, if you can drop that fear, knowing that I'm in control of even those you do fear, what you're going to remember is this. I died for you to bring you close to me. Don't forget my position. Don't forget my power. Don't forget my capability. Don't forget my faithfulness and my goodness. But don't fear that I've forgotten you. Y'all see this? He says, don't fear, therefore, you are more, you are of more value, and you are more valuable than, some of your translations may say a whole flock of sparrows. And if God can pay attention to one small bird, you can go from worried to worthy. You can step in and say, Lord, Wow, you actually care about me this much. And he's saying, do not fear, because he's wanting to comfort you in the relationship that you have with him. He's saying, if you have a relationship with me, you don't need to be afraid of what someone else is going to do or what they may say or how they may act. He's saying, don't worry about that. I've got you. Don't be afraid. I am with you. I'll never leave you, nor... I got one or two holy folk in here. Y'all know. 
I will not leave you nor forsake you. He says, not only am I with you now, I'll be with you in the future. Think about how many times we contemplate the future. We think about money. We think about where we're going to stay. We even think about vacations. We think about our kids' school, education. When we think about the future, how many times do you think about where God is? Oh, I'm by myself again. How many times is that you actually think in your mind where God is when you think about what's next and what's coming? And do you take the time to actually say, Lord, is this where you want me to be? And wait for him to answer. I know in my own life, there are times I start walking forward and I go, oh, wait a minute, Lord. (laughs) Right? Oh, wait a minute, Lord. And he'll look at me, he'll go, back up, son. You're getting ahead of me. You can't follow Jesus and you're in the front. You can't say that you're his disciple, but you're the one driving the car, the boat, whatever, or you're leading down the path. You have to be intentional and specific to say, Lord, where are you going? That's where I want to be, and that's where I want to go. And if it's not of you or for you, I don't want it. Because I fear the consequences of not being in alignment with you. So he says, look, don't fear those who kill you, but don't be afraid that you're thinking that I just want to kill you either. You're special to me. You're worth saving. You're worth dying for. And I know everything about you, everything that's on you, because I created you. My second, my second point is this. The first one is you can't fear two things equally. Watch this. God's value system is different from the world's. God's value system is different from the world's. Remember, you can't fear two things equally, and God's value system is different than the world's system. Remember, it it was only worth two copper coins to buy five, and God says, I made all of those. Why are you selling what belongs to me? Oh, that'll stay with you till later. And I I want you to grab a hold of this. The Lord is saying this is important, that you recognize that if you let man drive your decisions, if you let man drive your discussions, if you let man drive your life and where you're going, then what you're going to find is you're going to get man's reward. But if you follow Jesus, if you submit to his will, he'll say, yes, I'm glad you fear me. Now, don't be afraid. Let's go. I'm glad we established the protocol that I'm in charge. Great. Don't be afraid. Be with me. I want you in my presence, and I got you. Let's look back at verse 8. Let's look back at verse 8. He says, also, I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him, the Son of Man will also confess before the angels of God. It's amazing how in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, it says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, God, and God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So that's important because the mouth is, is powerful. I mean, in Proverbs 18, 21, it says the power of life and death is in the tongue. Now, be careful, because, you know, a lot of people have gotten themselves messed up talking. (laughs) But that's a foreshadow of the confessing of Jesus' already established position and admitting that in your heart, which I can't see, praise the Lord, (laughs) but in your heart you believe that not only did Jesus step into the world he created, was hated by the people he created, was beaten by the people he created, Created and the only man made thing that's in heaven today are the nail pierced hands, the side, and the scars that man put on Jesus. You ever consider that? There's nothing man made in heaven except the scars on our Savior. And before he ascended, he said, I'll be back. Hold down the fort, I'll be back. 
oh, I'm going to send my spirit. He's going to help you. He'll be in you. He'll be around you. He'll work through you. And it's important to know Jesus is being sincere. He's saying, confess me before people. Beginning of verse 9 starts with our favorite word once again. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Don't miss this. So the question I have for you this morning is this. What does it mean to deny Jesus? What does it mean to deny Jesus? You ever been angry at somebody for a really long time? And held it for a really long time? And only held it for a really long time? You might even still be holding it. But you absolutely decided, you know what? They're not worth forgiving. Oh, I went too deep, huh? I went too far. You decided in your heart that that person wasn't worth the little bit of emotions you might have to feel to forgive them and release them to the Lord. Consider the heinous acts you've done against God himself. Before you even came into being, before you were in the womb of your mother, Jesus died and forgave you. Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrated his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we know that we know that we know he didn't stay dead. That was a borrowed tomb. And because he was going to come back, that's why we celebrate today. And he said, not only are you worth saving, you're worth forgiving, and you're worth bringing to my table, bringing into my family, and showing you love that you do not deserve. That's grace. And that's mercy. That's the truth of the gospel that we must not deny him with today. So when you decide someone else not worthy of being forgiven, you're saying, I don't believe that that kind of forgiveness is possible. Oh, it's so hard sometimes seeing all these masks. I can't see your mouth. Unforgiveness is a quick way to deny him. How about coarse language and ugly talking? It's another way to deny him too. Because your words have impact, right? Y'all, who grew up hearing this saying? Sticks and stones may break my bones. Y'all know the rest? But words will. That's not really true. It sounds cute in nursery rhymes, but a uh, words matter. And if your words aren't honoring Jesus, the absolute opposite is what? It's crazy how people will get on their social media pages and get Facebook courageous, and they'll say things that are absolutely against the Lord, but they'll have in their profile tag, love the king. First John says, you cannot say you hate a brother you can see and love a God that you can't see. So somebody's being a hypocrite. And it's not Jesus. You can deny him. You can deny his death, burial, and resurrection by literally acting like you got no sense. I use bad English. Forgive me, Ma. (laughs) And I need you to see that's just one of the few ways that there is denial in your life. The way you live matters to Jesus because he rescued you so you could live. He blesses you over and over and over. And when he's done doing that, he blesses you over and over and over. You're awake, aren't you? Blessing. You're breathing, aren't you? Blessing. You ate something, didn't you? Blessing. You have some water. You got your eyesight. You got your feeling in your hands. Blessings. Why would you deny the one who went through so much to give you these blessings by not living like you know him? I mean, it's 
how you love your wife or your husband, kids, how you honor your parents. You know, that's the first commandment with a promise in the Ten Commandments. The first four are about your relationship with God. We call those the vertical commandments, right? Of the horizontal, meaning on the same level, the first one says, children, honor your father and your mother, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. That's the first commandment that has a promise on it. I'm just trying to tell the truth to you. Here's my third and final point. We're going to wrap this up and we're going to sing some more. Don't deny Jesus now. For he came back for you. Remember, you can't fear two things equally. If you think that declaring Jesus is Lord and he's alive, that you'll be judged or that someone will not let you get a job or you'll lose a friend or you're willing to let those fears control you, that's like being in the narrow hallway with snakes and spiders. Why would you be afraid of what someone's going to think or say because you declared his name? Now, let me preface with this. There are some of us followers of Jesus who are missionaries on the mission field go into very hostile areas, risking our life in a hostile to Christianity territory where you can be killed for declaring his name because no one there has an established gospel presence. So they say, Lord, I'm not afraid of them. I'm going in. Oh, gosh, they're not just like Jesus. But they can't go in wearing a He's Risen t-shirt. They can't go in with a book bag that says, He is my Lord. They can't do that. They have to dress up and have a suitcase and say, I'm here on business. But they're being as wise as a serpent and gentle as a dove. And them being there is their affirmation of Jesus. So don't think that I'm telling you walk into your office on Monday morning, Tuesday morning, and shotgun everybody. Do you know Jesus? I'm not ashamed. <laughs> I'm saying maybe do like Jesus did and get close to them first. And y'all have heard me say it before. Sometimes it takes connecting before you're correcting. And there are many times where we, where we deny him because we choose not even to acknowledge there's correction needed. Not just in the world, because that's easy to look at the speck in someone else's eye and not the plank in our own. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, affirming him is looking at our own plank first and confessing our sins. Does that sound familiar? Again, you cannot fear two things equally. God's value system is different from the world's. And don't deny Jesus now, for he came back for you. And he's going to come back again. Now let me me close with a short story for you. Because I want you to consider what denying Jesus really what it looks like. There was a family who lived in a modest home that caught on fire. And as the house was burning, the child was trapped in their bedroom. And the parents were trapped in theirs. And they lost their life. The fire crew, the the police, they all came. And because the boy's room was on a second floor and it was already starting to crumble because of the great heat, the ladders couldn't lean on the house. And the the gears for the ladder on the back of the fire truck just happened to stop working. And there's this boy trapped in his room. The firemen takes off his oxygen tank. He takes off his suit. And he begins to start climbing up a large pole that was holding the gutters. 
checking its dexterity. But because of the flames on the house, even with his gloves on, it began to sear the skin in his palms. But he had to save that boy. And so he starts to climb one hand grip at a time. And the more he grabs, the more pain he's in. The higher he goes, the more it's hot. The more he grabs, the more he's suffering. But he remembers there's a boy crying at the window. And he makes his way up and he reaches out his hot hand. He says, grab my arm. My hands are too hot. And he grabs the boy and he puts him on his back and he begins to slowly climb back down. The pole is still hot. His gloves are burning through. It's now his bare palms on this hot rod. He gets the boy to safety. He then immediately gets swift, whisked away to take into an ambulance to check him and he then goes to a facility to get care. A few months go by, and he's up for adoption. And a few people in the community have come because they knew the family. The family was a good family. It was a tragic end to the parents' lives. A doctor was standing there. He said, I'll take him. I'll train him to learn my profession. An engineer was standing beside him. He said, I will take him. I will train him into my profession. He could add to the world in this way. A professor was also standing there. He said, I will take him. I will enter him into the world of academia. And the judge was wondering, wow, I wonder which one we'd rather go to. So he looks at the boy, and the boy is standing there, not sure how to respond. Then the doors of the courtroom open. And silently, The man walks in with scars on his hands, dressed humbly, not saying a word. And the little boy's eyes were drawn to him. And he saw the man's hands. And he said, that's him. That's him. He said, Judge, I want to go with that man. Because if he loved me enough to take that pain, I want him to care for me for the rest of my life. If that little boy wouldn't deny that fireman, why would you deny the one who died to save you? I want us to never forget The beating that we deserve, he took it. The stripes on his back, we deserved, he took it. The mocking, the saliva out of the mouth of strangers on his face, in his wounds, on his body, the body of my risen king, it had saliva on it from onlookers. And we dare spit on his name today by living wrong. Don't deny him. His hands still bear the scars of what you've done. And he offers that same hand to you in love and acceptance if you will confess him. Hey, I have sinned. And I believe that you are Lord you came, you lived a perfect life, that you died, but you didn't stay dead. That's why we're celebrating every Sunday and most of all, even on this Sunday, because he came back. And he walked into the courtroom of eternity and said, put him on my tab. How will you respond to Jesus today? How will you respond to Jesus today? What is the Spirit saying to you? How are you supposed to respond, to repent, to turn from what used to be? Let today be day one. Stop saying one day. And allow 
the king to bring you to his table. All he asks is for you to confess him and not to deny him. How will you respond to him today? If you've never ever confessed your sin and believed in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you can pray that prayer with us today and we will celebrate. Because that means that you've come to life too. You've been born again. So I'm going to pray. And if you need to respond in the quietness of your heart, you bow your head, you can talk to him. We just want to know about it. I'll be out in the lobby. You can tell me. We've got other ministers here and deacons here and trustees here. They'd love to hear from you. We've got ministry leaders here. We have many followers of Jesus who would love to celebrate your new life. And you can respond that way. The other response could be this. Maybe, just maybe, you need to consider that someone is worth your forgiveness to. And then you need to say, you know what, Lord, if you could forgive me, then I should be able to forgive anyone. Because you're not asking for me to give up my life to forgive them. You're saying just to give up the grudge. How are you going to respond to Jesus today? As I pray, consider what he's saying to you and respond accordingly. Let us pray. Lord God of heaven and earth, creator Lord, you have the power to do anything. And everything we see and everything that we are and all that we have is because of your great power. And you put your power on magnificent display. Lord, when you took off your mantle and you laid it on your throne and you came and stepped into time and space and you took on flesh, you came to love a people who didn't love you back. You came to rescue a people who wanted to end your life. You came to model perfection for the wicked and unrighteous. And you did it perfectly. And Lord, even in your last words, you said, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing to me. And God, right now, by the power of your spirit, move on these, your people. Everyone under the sound of my voice, God, whatever it is that you are calling them to do in response to your truth, God, by your spirit, give them courage to not fear what man may do, but to fear the God, the God who made everything, the one who said, fear me and then be my friend. Lord, you are good and you are holy, and you are perfect, and we thank you, God. Help those who claim your name but currently are in the wrong lane. Help them see the error of their ways and get back in alignment with you. Lord, we trust you for that. And right now, God, we just ask, that you have your way. God, we love you and we thank you that today we got to celebrate once again your resurrection. And Lord, today as families come together, as families do Zoom calls together, as families call one another, as families connect, may they remember the reason for this day's celebration is you and not to deny you by being prideful or grudging, but Lord, to confess you by living the way you called us to. Lord, thank you. And we love you. Now, by the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, our risen King, 
the love of the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit. May he be with us all until we come back together again. And all of God's people said amen, amen, and amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. At this time, our band is, and our worship team are going to sing. If you want to sit and meditate and respond, you're welcome to do so. If you'd like to exit, you can follow the directions of our welcome team. They'll give you directions on how to exit. Just look to them. They'll tell you whether to move on the outsides or where to go. But if you want to sit and listen and talk to him, you're welcome. We're glad that you're here. Happy Resurrection Sunday. I love you. God bless you. And you are sent.